pictures. And he told me when he met with me on several occasions in New York that he knew better than ever to go to Hollywood because he knew nothing about the motion pictures. He just knew about running companies. And, uh, but he sent me out there because I wanted to be a producer. And uh, I didn't know how to be a producer. And he, but he introduced me to some pretty interesting people, one of whom is, is a featured person in this Indecent Exposure book about the Cliff Robertson scandal, a, a guy named Ray Stark, whose son was Peter Stark, who committed suicide. And Peter Stark's name is at the uh, producing program at the University of Southern California, the Peter Stark Producers Program. I think that was Ray's way of, of uh, saying he was sorry for browbeating his son into suicide. But um, the other person that I met was a man named John Veach. Johnny Veach was one of the senior vice presidents of Columbia, nice guy, former actor, not much of an executive, but very well liked throughout the industry and he knew everybody. And he, one of the first people he introduced me to was David Ladd, who's the younger brother of the subject of this film, Alan Ladd Jr. Uh, I, don't, I guess most of you being film aficionados know about uh, Alan Ladd, the actor, uh, mostly because of his movie Shane, which was my all-time favorite early Western. But he was essentially a, a post-war, film noir type actor and uh, was married to a woman uh, and had a child named Alan Ladd Jr. in 1937. And then he had an affair with a, another woman, divorced his wife, and had a, married that woman and David Ladd, my friend, who's my age, uh, was the child of that marriage. And, uh, but through David and his friendship over the years, I've met his entire family and got to know Laddie, not well, but I, I knew him. He was a very quiet kind of guy. I've got some notes here. There's a lot of stuff in Wikipedia if you want to dig deeper on, on him. But he's one of those quiet, strong, unsung heroes, kind of like the character that his father played in Shane. But he just had a, a growing up in, in the Hollywood family, he, he had a good eye for material. His, his brother, David, was a child star. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the movie that he was in. Uh, uh, a boy of, it was, let's see, Dog of Flanders, that's what it was. Uh, he was a star of that when he was a child. And as he explained to me, he said, my dad put his friend's kids in his pictures and his friends put me in their pictures. So he did about 10 or 15 pictures as a child and then never acted again and became a producer. But uh, Laddie, as he was called, being the son of Alan Ladd, uh, didn't start as an actor at all. He started as an, an, uh, as an agent when he was 25 years old. And he moved to London. He didn't stay in Hollywood. He, he went to London and, and uh, after being an agent for a, a bit of time, I think when he was, um, let's see, 63, six years later when he was in his early 30s, he started producing movies and he produced about six or eight uneventful movies in Europe and then decided to come back to, to Hollywood. But what's interesting about Hollywood, and you probably know this all also, is that they tend to revere the stars of Hollywood and they tend to revere the children of the stars of Hollywood. I just heard the other day, or maybe it was Spike yesterday that said, there's a movie coming out and, and the star is Denzel Washington's son. Well, he's going to have a great opportunity to be a working actor in Hollywood and he'll bring to the table what he brings to the table, but he certainly got the chance because he's the son of a very, very famous movie star and that's just the way it goes in Hollywood. That's kind of America's version of royalty, although uh, Andy Warhol, who I uh, spent a month with in China doing a documentary years ago, said, no, how, it's not the uh, Hollywood people who are the royalty of America, it's the Kennedys. He was convinced it was just the Kennedys and that it wasn't the, uh, the Hollywood community. But nevertheless, the Hollywood community runs a close second to the Kennedys in being America's brand of royalty. We certainly pay a lot of attention to them and what they do and who they marry and where they go and the trouble they get into and so forth. But uh, I say that because when Laddie came back after doing a fistful of uneventful movies, the titles of which I don't remember, he became uh, head of creative affairs at 20th Century Fox which is a pretty big jump because he was in his early 30s and suddenly he's head of creative affairs at 20th Century Fox. However, he did have an amazing eye and, and I guess the thing that he's most famous for nurturing and making sure it came into fruition is Star Wars. 
the Star Wars, it wasn't like Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate that became so expensive that it actually brought down a studio, but Star Wars could have brought down a studio had it not had what Heaven's Gate didn't have, which was quality humor, amazing production values, and all sorts of other things. But it would never have been made when it was made, or it might not have been made at all had it not been for Laddie, because he, the board at 20th Century Fox didn't want to do the picture. Uh, but he saw something in it that he felt was worth going to the mat for, and he went to the mat for it. And uh, that's probably his biggest credit, even though he's an unsung producer in effect. He was an executive at the studio, so he's credited for, quote, green lighting Star Wars, but it didn't work that way back in those days. Uh, executives at the studios aren't the same now as they were back in the days when Irving Thalberg and other people ran them. Those, they were producers, they were hands-on producers who knew how to make films. Lots, lots of studio heads today have actually never made a film uh, or written a script. Uh, and they just kind of think, oh, I like this one, oh, I, I like that one. And sometimes you find yourself in meetings in Hollywood with executives at studios and, and you know they haven't read the material that you're discussing at the meeting. And yet they're giving you notes as to how it should be changed. So they want to look good for their bosses. Anyway, he initiated uh, Fox during, initiated Star Wars during those tough times. Um, but, and about two years later, I think this was about 79, he created the Lad Company. And he made some films there, some of which were really, really good, and some of which were pretty good. But he won two Academy Awards, uh, or his films won two Academy Awards. One was The Chariots of Fire, which I think got Best Picture, and the other was The Right Stuff. I don't know what that Academy Award was for. I don't think it was the best picture. But, but the one that I'm most impressed by myself personally is Blade Runner. And he was a producer of Blade Runner. There never would be a Blade Runner but for, for him. And, and uh, that's recognizing the script. That's approving the cast. And that's a lot of things that uh, today, in, in my mind, are iconic decisions that produced an iconic movie. I, I don't, how many of you have seen the second version of it? Did anybody, did, did you think it was any good? Yes. Yes. Great. It's a, it's great. It, it's a yeah, it's, I mean, the first one, it's sort of a tough act to follow, and a lot of times people are just, don't even want to do that. They want to just live with the original and not try to remake it. At any rate, Blade Runner. Uh, in 1985, he left being a private company and being an independent producer, deals in studios and founded, he became, he went to work for MGM, United Artists, uh, and he got up to the position of chairman of you know, MGM when it partnered with Pathé Communications, a big European communications firm. And the, the other big film that he's credited with green lighting is Thelma and Louise, another iconic film. Uh, he left being a, a studio executive once again in the 90s, early 90s, and he reconstituted the Lad Company. and. Uh, he won another Oscar for Braveheart with our not so favorite, I think it was Mel Gibson, as I recall. Uh, and in 2007, uh, he got his star on the Hollywood uh, Walk of Fame. Um, but he's a wonderful, quiet, good person. He's not in the greatest health today. Wikipedia and so forth says he's still working as a producer, but he's kind of infirm. But uh, he's about 80. 81 or 82 these days. But a wonderful guy, a gentleman uh, from an all-star family, and I'm really interested to see how this film explores. It's made by his daughter, he's got a number of kids, but this one daughter, I, I was hoping she would be here, and I tried to get David to come too, um, but we were unable to get them to attend the festival. But they're both aware of the festival and, and love this festival, and one of these days we'll come back to this festival and appear with other of their productions. In all events, I hope you enjoy this. I'm certainly enjoying being here and uh, welcoming you to the last day of this 30th anniversary of our wonderful, wonderful film festival. Thank you.